My message today is Russia's role in Revelation. Russia's role in Revelation. When Christ came the first time, the church on earth was looking for a political messiah. Right? They wanted somebody to come and conquer Rome, drive out the, the, the invading armies, and that they could have that theocracy once again. But you know, because of this political focus, they were distracted from spiritual truths. Right? They focused on the political events of the day. The Messiah to them was a deliverer from earthly powers. And because of this, and greatly because of their misunderstanding and application of prophecy, they missed the boat. Jesus gave the sad words there at the beginning of John. He says, or the, John says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Now, I submit to you that we are at a parallel time in history. Just as the church was not prepared for the first advent, I submit that the church is not prepared for the second advent. People are looking at prophecy through the wrong lenses. Now, when I say church, I'm talking about the church broadly. God's people through all the different many denominations and, and faiths. And God has people there. Amen? We know that. Revelation 18 tells us He has people scattered throughout Babylon. But He's calling them out. Now, we want to have a clear and distinct message of truth that will prepare people for the second coming. But if we misunderstand prophecy, if we misapply the Scriptures, we can be in just as much danger as the first church, the early church, the Jewish church was in not being ready for the first advent of Christ. The church today continues to read Bible prophecy through a political lens. It's really a sad state of affairs. It's really a danger we must avoid. And uh, you'll see as I, as I go along a little bit further, but it's very critical. I want to emphasize this. I want to underline it. I want to highlight it. Put a magnifying glass on it. We must understand the Bible for ourselves. Otherwise, we're going to be just as unprepared as the people were in the days of Noah. Just as unprepared as the people were in the days of Lot. Just as unprepared as the people were in the days of Jesus when He came the first time. So with the recent war of Russia upon Ukraine, there's been a resurgence of the messages and publications that make the case that we are seeing the fulfillment of prophecy as Russia is expanding their territory by, by force. My question is, are we seeing a fulfillment of prophecy over this last month? Now, I will say, we can, we, I think we all can concede. There's the political Christianity. I need to keep up on my slides for you guys. We can all concede that Matthew 24, 6 and 7 is happening right now. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, Jesus says, for all these things must come to pass. But what? The end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. I would dare say that with confidence, we can say that this is happening before our eyes. Now, we could also say with confidence that it was happening in the First World War, the Second World War, through the Korean War, Vietnam, the Gulf War, the Afghanistan and Iraqi Wars, the war on crime, the war on drugs, and every bit of wars out there. There's wars happening and rumors of wars, conflicts about places you have a hard name, hard time pronouncing. So yes, this is being fulfilled. But the end is not yet, it says. And then it mentions other signs of the times. And then it tells us, of course, the, the greatest sign of all, we heard it earlier, is the gospel going to the world. Right? When that is fulfilled, then the end will come. So, But beyond this clear application in a more general and broad sense of what's happening right now, we are told by most Christian publications and preachers today, and I say most, I mean those that are most notorious, those that are, you know, uh, YouTube channels, televangelists, uh, TV We are hearing a consistent message today that Russia is a major end-time player of prophecy. But the, the question is, is that true? Now here is what is being taught. 
And, and maybe you haven't been exposed to this. Maybe, you know, we're a little echo chamber and all we like is to hear sermons uh, from our own selves and, 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 and you know, agree with them. And, and we never venture beyond what we already believe is true. Now, and I'm not necessarily dismissing that as a bad thing, but I would suggest that if you're out there doing personal evangelism, maybe digital evangelism on social media, if you're out there doing that, you are going to be exposed to these teachings simply because the people you're trying to reach are teaching them. So it's likely you're going to be exposed to these things, and it's, it's, it is so important that we've got to have good, solid, biblical answers, or one of two things are going to happen. You yourself will be deceived, or somebody who could be undeceived is left in their deception because you couldn't help them because you just simply didn't know. But I can tell you right now, all of us can know. All of us can know our Bibles well enough that we can give an answer to those who ask the hope that is in us. All of us can know our Bibles well enough that, as I mentioned earlier, we can all give a Bible study. Oh, no, 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 not me. Yes, you. All of us can. In fact, I wouldn't just say that all of us can. I think to some degree, in the sphere that God has given you, God is not just saying you can do it. He's expecting it of you. And maybe that looks different. A Bible study, maybe for you, is teaching children. Or maybe your spouse. Maybe your neighbor. Maybe it's teaching a whole class. But all of us can share our faith with others and explain the Bible. But you can't do it if you don't know it. So here is what is commonly known as the Russia prophecy. The Russia prophecy. And, I, and I've overly simplified this, so bear with me on that. But it basically is telling us that Ezekiel 38 and 39, those two chapters, refer to a confederacy of Russia and Islamic nations, and that together they will invade modern-day Israel. That Rosh, that's referred to there, and we're going to read this here in just a moment, Ezekiel 38 verse 2 refers to Russia, and that Meshach there is Moscow. And that Persia refers to Iran. And so the, the, with, with Russia and the Islamic nations working together, they attack Israel. And, of course, there's a lot that, that comes from this. What, what, what undergirds this theory that puts Russia in the forefront of Bible prophecy is this teaching of what's called the uh, pre-tribulation secret rapture. I'm sure you all have heard of that one time or another. This idea that, that before Jesus comes, there's going to be a, uh, a, a time period, a seven-year time period of tribulation, which before that happens, the saints are snatched away. And that during that seven-year time period, the Antichrist rises up and ends up making a, an agreement with Israel. They rebuild the temple, and, and all these different things happen. I'm not going to go in and try to necessarily explain the whole theory to you. But the, this theory has been made very popular in uh, evangelical schools and colleges. In, you, you see it uh, on TV and radio, like I mentioned earlier, televangelists. Uh, you've got uh, 1967, the Schofield Study Bible. When this study Bible came out, it was really the first time that referenced Russia as a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, now, there are some, perhaps dating back even as much as a, de a century before this, that, that, that touched on the idea, but it was never really broadly accepted, the idea that Russia played a role and a part in end-time events. But when Schofield put it out there, Oh, wow, this thing kind of shot up as very important. And then you had books like Late Great Planet Earth from Hal Lindsey that continued that narrative. But then the Left Behind series came out that really was promoting this, this same secret rapture theory and, and how all these different last day players. Uh, TBN, if you listen to anything on TBN, praise the Lord, there's some good programming on TBN. Uh, it's because we worked hard to get some of our Adventist programming there. But other than that, most of the teachings you see on TBN continues this narrative of this pre-tribulation secret rapture. And today, because of the, 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 what's going on in the news, there's a lot of commentary that's putting Russia at the forefront. And the argument, and 100% of the time, the argument goes back to uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 and applying that to what's happening uh, right now. You recognize this guy, President Ronald Reagan? He was a, he was a Protestant Christian, and he, he, he identified Russia 
in the Bible, in Ezekiel 38 and 39 himself, he said Magog was Russia. And this actually influenced his foreign policy, if you believe it or not. As, uh, but, you know, as, as, as popular as this teaching might be today, and by the way, it, teachings become popular when everybody's teaching it. But just because something is popular doesn't necessarily make it true. I remember, uh, well, I don't remember this because I was just a kid and I wasn't even a Christian uh, back at the beginning of Ronald Reagan's, Ronald Reagan's era. But I understand from my study of history and Bible prophecy that a lot of Christians were really concerned about what Ronald Reagan was doing because of what? He had the name Ronald Wilson Reagan, three or six letters in each of his three names, 666, Ronald Reagan had to be the Antichrist. I think they've called every president since then the Antichrist as well. It's interesting that it's easy to call somebody the Antichrist who you disagree with. I think we have to be careful how we apply Bible prophecy. It might be clever. It might be convenient. It might even be convincing. But if it's not in the Bible, if, it's not, if it cannot be demonstrated by God's Word, then it simply isn't truth, and we have to reject it. Friends, we must dig deeper into God's Word. That's exactly the words that, well, was it Lisa said that earlier? We must dig deeper. We must dig deeper. No, no, she said the time is short. That was another thought I had later on. I'm getting my thoughts confused. But we must dig deeper. We've got to have the attitude that we are not going to understand truth unless we ourselves put our every energy into it. Our diligence, friends. Now I'm going to tell you, this, this secret rapture theory and this, this idea that Russia plays a part in, in, this, in, this, in this attack on Israel, it, it's, it's a dangerous teaching. It's especially odious because of this. When people believe in a secret rapture teaching, they, it, it puts us this idea that they could put off salvation until after the rapture. That there's going to be a second chance. You know how dangerous that thought is? And I've met secular people who say, well, if you Christians are right, then I'll wait for the rapture, then I'll get my life right. You know how many people went to their graves believing that? Never giving their hearts to Christ because of a Christian, so-called Christian doctrine was leading them to be complacent? Very dangerous teaching. Christians themselves say, oh, I don't need to study prophecy. I'm not going to be here for all that. But when all that happens, and they are here, will they be prepared? No, they're going to be deceived because they haven't got to know their word. I've had some tell me, I don't even read the book of Revelation because that's for a time I'm not even going to be here. Well, if you don't know the Scriptures, how are you going to stand in defense of the Scriptures? How are you going to stand up against temptation and against the last day deceptions, which are going to be so overwhelming? Now, I want to ask you, how would you respond in an intelligent, biblical way if somebody confronted you and said, oh yeah, what's happening right now? Russia, it's leading up to a war with, with, with Israel. How would you respond? Now, I've... Asked some folks, and they said, I don't know. I don't know how I'd respond. I'm not sure. I appreciate the honest answers, but let's not say that for long. Let's get to know our... And by the way, I'm going to tell you, my message today is not going to be a comprehensive message. I'm not going to give you the, the depth that a, a good Bible study would bring you. But it, I hope it will get you uh, tickled enough. Maybe tickle is a bad word when you, Paul uses it in a negative sense. But uh, I hope you get excited enough, is what I'm saying to say, that you'll go and dig deeper, that you will go and search the Scriptures for yourself to find out the answers. Studying the Bible isn't just a job for ministers and Sabbath school teachers. It's all of our jobs. Jude verse 3 tells us to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Now when you think of contend, what do you think of? A sports arena, right? You think of people striving hard. He says, contend for the faith. 2 Timothy 3.15 says, we must rightly divide the word of truth. Are we doing that, friends? The attitude of the Jews when Jesus came into the world the first time was to, was to trust their rabbis, right? It was, to, it was to trust the priests and say, you know what? If they believe it, I believe it too. If they don't believe it, ah, it's probably not right. How do you know? Well, he's smart. 
He's, he's been in the, in the pulpit a long time. Uh, you know, he's been a priest most of his life. He, he's, he's, he's been a teacher of the law. He's a good teacher too. And so people tend to trust people like this instead of having that Berean spirit that says, I will research and study these things for myself. I will examine the Scriptures for myself and not take anybody's word for it, including Pastor Wyatt's. I was... uh, uh, I mentioned this in the Prophecy Seminar. By the way, if you have questions about the, the secret rapture teaching, I did a seminar this past fall. All of those things are recorded. They're all online. You can get them on a uh, the link on the website there. It'll take you to the YouTube channel and um, uh, newalbanysda.org. And you can watch all those uh, messages. One of them, I really go into great detail about the rapture and, and what the Bible says about that. Uh, I won't get, to, get into that today. But I remember sharing in that, in that series um, a little bit about uh, a brother, I won't mention his name, he's a very popular uh, evangelical teacher and probably on several Christian TV stations and radio stations. And Anyway, he during the, the time when the blood moons were popular, I think it was 2015, remember the blood moons? And they, they basically were saying, hey, you know, when the blood moon happens, you know, that there's, there's going to be two this year. And between those two blood moons, there's going to be a war on Israel. Iran is going to launch a nuclear attack on Israel. And, and, this is, and they were going back to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. And they said that this is going to happen, definitely going to happen. It's certainly going to happen. Bible, if, if it doesn't happen, the Bible's not true, is, is you know, the kind of language they would say. This is how certain it is in God's Word. And, they, and because of that, that sense of authority, that sense of, of confidence, people said, yeah, well, you know. And then everybody I talk, that, I, that I was studying with or, or talking to, everybody would believe that these, that in, this, in this idea of Russia and, and Iran and other places coming with a confederacy to attack Israel. Well, after the second blood moon passed and nothing happened, the guy just stopped talking about it. He wrote another book and the attention got off of that. And, and I tell you what, it's deceptive. And I, and, I, and I get it. I think that a lot of these teachers, they're, they're trying to get people excited about the Bible. And they're trying to get people excited about prophecy. And maybe they're trying to sell a few books too. And, and I don't, I'm not going to question all their motivations. But I think we have the sense that if we knew how short time was, we would prepare and get ready. And so people keep setting dates or talking about dates. I mean, even, even among ourselves, people are talking about dates. We can't. Listen, we don't need dates to get us energized. We don't need some short date down the line to tell us to get ready. Because, friends, we need to be getting ready today. The gospel of Jesus Christ itself should be motivation enough to get us excited and enthusiastic about being ready and helping others prepare to be ready. Today, today, today was what William Miller said, the great Baptist preacher, who prepared a great generation to be ready for Jesus' coming back in the 1800s. He said, today, 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 I like that attitude. We're never going to be prepared for the last days if we have the attitude that we're just going to trust our preachers to get it right. Pastor so-and-so, oh, he knows the word. I'll mention one preacher. I'm not even sure if he's around anymore, but uh, Jack Van Impey. You guys have heard of Jack Van Impey, some of you guys? Uh, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon of his, but... um, when I was locked up and incarcerated, I met a lot of people who said, oh, have you ever heard of Jack Van Impey? Well, the only reason I ever heard of him is because people were telling me about him, but I didn't watch it. I never had an opportunity to. So I heard a lot about this guy, but they say, oh, this guy has the Bible memorized. And because he has the Bible memorized, his understanding of prophecy has to be right. Hmm. Who else has the Bible memorized? Satan has the Bible memorized. Doesn't mean he's teaching truth, does it? Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to compare this guy to Satan necessarily. I'm just suggesting that it doesn't matter how many degrees a person has. It doesn't matter how long they've been a Christian or studying the Bible. We've got to always test the word for ourselves. Now, I want to take you and share with you about the true role of Russia in the book of Revelation. And as we talk about a better understanding of Revelation, uh, uh, a better, sorry, better understanding of Ezekiel 38 and 39, I think we're going to see uh, a lot of the stuff start to make sense in the book of Revelation. Um, Again, this is what's being preached everywhere right now. Now, if you haven't been hearing it, it's because you haven't been listening. It's out there. Now, I'm not going to be exhaustive like I said, but I hope you will be inspired to open your own Bibles and and spend some considerable amount of time searching the Scriptures in this regard. 
Now, before I really jump into this study on Ezekiel 38 and 39, I just want to read a quote from you to you from the book, The Great Controversy. And this is a powerful quote. One of my favorites is it's from a cha chapter in a Great Controversy called Scriptures, the Safeguard. And I encourage you to read the whole chapter. But here's what it says. It starts out, it says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The people of God, from Isaiah 8.20, the people of God are directed to the Scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive power of the spirits of darkness. So just remember, we're not just fighting against teachers that have some good ideas or bad ideas, I should say, but they're really smart teachers. It's not just that. There are, this is a spiritual battle taking place. And don't think that your intellect and your education is enough. We need more than that. We need the Holy Spirit of God as we study the Scriptures to be able to fight the fight of these last days. Now watch. Satan employs every possible device to prevent men from obtaining a knowledge of the Bible. For its plain utterances reveal his deceptions. At every revival of God's work, the prince of evil is arousing to more intense activity. He is now putting forth his utmost efforts for a final struggle against Christ and his followers. It's final struggle. Remember the Bible says there in Revelation 12, he says, the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has but a short time. He's, it's like a, a snake, knowing that he's about to be stomped. I mean, he's like, he's fighting hard. And that's the devil. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So, watch this, guys. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. Every statement. And of course, we're going to see more and more miracles as the days go on. Many false ones, actually, the majority false ones, but also some true ones. How are we going to know the difference? By the Word of God. Now watch this last quote. I love this part. None but those who have fortified the minds with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. That's why you cannot depend on your preacher. If you're not experiencing for yourself that personal connection with God through His Word, not letting any of the, the worldly things crowd out and distract you from, 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 from understanding this book, and friends, I am scared for you. I am scared for you. But the good news is, if you're spending that time in God's Word, if you're digging deep in there, if you're willing to put in the energy and the effort on a daily basis to test whether these things are so, like the Bereans, then friends, I think you'll be safe. Now back to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Let's begin. Actually, if you would, just turn your Bibles there. Uh, you may already be there. We've Mentioned it a few times. Now, they're actually fairly long chapters, and so I won't have uh, the opportunity to actually read the entirety of them uh, in this study. But again, I encourage you to do that. Take that time, read Ezekiel 38, read Ezekiel 39, and then I'll give you other passages. Take notes. Later on, we're going to see several in Revelation you're going to want to read as well in connection with this to go in deeper. But looking at 38, this is kind of the introduction to what's going on here. Beginning in chapter 38, Ezekiel 38, verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all, you, with all your army horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all of its troops, the house of Tagamara from the north, from the far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. Now, again, this, these chapters contain a lot of information, but my evangelical friends read this passage and they see in here fulfillment of prophecy. What do they say? They say, well, hey, who is in the far north? Well, you can't go further north than Russia. 
So who's in the far north? Russia is. And, and who is uh, Persia? That's modern-day Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya. Those are also Muslim countries along with Iran. Uh, you've got up higher, you've got uh, Rosh, they call Russia. Meshach, they call Moscow. Uh, Tubal, they make some other kind of application. And they say all of these things are evidences that we're talking about Russia because Rosh, Russia. Sounds really close. And, and look, I, I, I get why somebody would, would want to do that, or maybe you know, they, they would see that in the Scriptures. I'm not, I, don't, I don't dismiss somebody thinking. I think thinking is a good thing. Asking questions is a good thing. But we've got to be careful at the conclusions. Because if you continue reading through the rest of this chapter into the next chapter as well, which, by the way, they're like, they're, it's one section. So 38, 39 is like kind of one major section. And when you read through here, you can find that really it doesn't fit this scenario at all. I mean, far from it. Uh, and I won't go into great detail on, on all of them, but let me just give you a quick overview of what 38 and 39 is all about. Again, this is just a brief overview and outline of those chapters. First, you have an introduction to Gog and his allies. That's just this confederacy. There is a confederacy here. They work together, and they do attack God's people, right? Uh, God gets proud and would make an evil plan to attack Israel while they're dwelling peacefully. All right. Then you have God coming against Israel, so this was the attack. God judges Gog and destroys his forces. All right? And then Gog and his allies are completely destroyed and buried over seven months. So it was actually a long time of, of burying all these people. I mean, we're talking probably hundreds of thousands in these armies. And then you go on in chapter 19, Gog and his allies are feasted upon by birds and beasts. That's chapter 39. I'm sorry, that's, that's 19. I'm sorry, guys. That's 39. Thank you for um, my wife who pointed that out. 39, not 19. Um, and then you have Israel restored from captivity. And yeah, that, that's it. So it's basically seven sections. And by the way, when you read Ezekiel, Ezekiel as a whole, there's a lot of sevens through Ezekiel. Ezekiel 39, there's actually a lot of sevens in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, again, sorry about that typo. And so, um, and I guess that would be 38 instead of 18 on the, on the previous one. Thank you guys for noticing that. But don't be distracted by my mistake. Preachers make mistakes. It just demonstrates you need to be trusting and reading for yourself, right? Get, to, get in the Scriptures. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Now, I'm going to admit something. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is kind of a tough passage to understand. In fact, if you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, um, there's actually a lot of passages in there that are really hard for us to understand in, uh, in these last days. Oh, somebody's fixing that for me. <laughs> you go ahead if you want. I, I'll talk for a second. So, but here's what I want you to think about. Even though it's a difficult passage to understand, there's things that we can, we can take care of and be sure of that, that, that it that it excludes and it does not fit, okay? And there's things that we, you know, I'm not saying we may have all the answers, but there's things that you can definitely exclude. And in the context of these chapters, can definitely exclude Russia from playing a major part in last day events, a leading part anyway. And so, but let's just say this. Let's just say if these events happen in a literal way, every scholar out there would honestly say it has not happened yet. Because, you know, the, the way it's described, the, the events of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, it just has not happened yet. And in the context is actually, you go a little bit before in 38, 37, you have the dry, Valley of Dry Bones. In chapter 40 through 48, you've got uh, the, the building of this temple, which is a very unique temple. Um, and again, nobody is acknowledging that these things have actually happened yet. So, so somehow, uh, even if you're reading it in a very literal way, it, everybody admits it hasn't happened yet. So the question is, will it happen in the future in a literal way? Has it happened in the past in a figurative way, or will it happen in the future in a figurative way or in a uh, more of a spiritual way? Now, most people, like I said, lean on the idea that it's literal and that it's actually coming to pass right now is, or soon is going to happen in which the attack on Israel will take place. And then, uh, th of course, there's some conditions in the passage, and that is that Israel has to be dwelling safely. Uh, unwalled cities, um, that they're at peace with their neighbors, and that's whenever uh, Gog and Magog and the Confederates come against 
Israel at that time. And then God intervenes in a miraculous way. God destroys all the armies. They bury them in this huge mound, this huge hill that takes seven months to fill up the grave sites. There's so many dead people. That's the literal fulfillment of it. But that's how a lot of people still read it, that that's going to happen here really soon. Now, there's several problems with this. With this uh, am I clicking this button on my own? She's like, she's shaking her head, yes. All right. So there's several problems with this, um, this view of Scripture. Now, I could probably give you a good dozen of them in my own studies. But I'm going to share with you the main problem, the number one problem that really overshadows all the other problems, which there's a lot. What is the main problem? The main problem is that that interpretation of Scripture does not consider, this is very important, listen now, that interpretation of Scripture does not consider what the New Testament says about Gog and Magog. As Protestants, we believe in the Bible and the Bible only as our rule and guide for, for truth and practice, right? If that's the case, then friends, we've got to let the Bible, the Protestant principle of letting the Bible interpret itself to be our guiding principle in understanding what we're talking about here. So as it says in 2 Peter 1, verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. We don't have the right, or really the business, of interpreting the Scriptures ourselves. If we're going to understand the Bible, we must let the Bible explain itself. So coming to conclusions with, without acknowledging what the Bible says about those very things, it, it's, it's really biblical malpractice. Is that a thing? It's important that if the Bible gives a term, we let the Bible explain that term. And if the Bible doesn't explain it, then we've got to be very careful and not be dogmatic about things, right? Let's, let's be slow to, to come to conclusions and, and speak so authoritatively about it if we just don't know because the Bible doesn't really say. But if the Bible does say, then whatever conclusions you come up with, it's got to be consistent with what that says in the Bible, right? I hope I'm making sense here. Let me just make this point. Revelation speaks clearly about Gog and Magog. In fact, I would go so far as to say it tells us exactly who Gog and Magog is. But let me tell you, in all my, and I've heard, not just in preparation of this, but just in, over time, I have heard so many messages from my evangelical friends and, and other Christians who study the Bible talk about Gog and Magog and talk about Russia and talk about Ezekiel 38 and 39, and not one of them, 100%, without exception, avoids what Revelation says about Gog and Magog. That is absolutely wrong. We cannot do that. So, with that says, with that said, let's look at the Revelation and see how Ezekiel 38 and 39 applies. Now, there's, there's actually a lot of parallels. You know there's 404 verses in the book of Revelation. Of those 404 verses, the majority of those are allusions or actual uh, references to passages in the Old Testament. So if you want to understand Revelation, you've got to study your Old Testament. But of those, much of it comes from the book of Daniel. But get this. Revelation uses a lot of symbols from the book of Ezekiel. And I submit to you, it may be next to Daniel, the most amount of symbols comes from the book of Ezekiel. Now, I haven't done the math on that. I'm just saying from my impression of reading the whole and comparing with Scripture. But it's, it's a lot. And I want to share with you just a few of the parallels I found just out of chapter 38 and chapter 39. So here you have great earthquake, hailstones, mountains throw down, flooding rain, great hailstones, I have that there twice, fire and brimstone. These are all things mentioned here in Ezekiel chapter 38 when God intervenes. It's actually, yeah, chapter 38 when God intervenes uh, for Israel's sake, right? But here in Revelation chapter 16, you see God bringing down here, and this is the seventh plague, God bringing down these same things right before the coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? And Gog, chapter Ezekiel 38, 21, talks about Gog and his armies attacking each other. Right? They, 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 in fact, I'll just read it right here. It's uh, verse uh, 21. It says, every man's sword will be against his neighbor, his brother, and they'll attack one another. And then Revelation 17, 16 through 18, talks about how, how Babylon will eventually turn on itself. You know, first they're attacking God's people, right? But then they realize they're a lost cause. They start turning on each other. Again, interesting parallel. Here's some more. The sacrificial meal of the birds and beasts upon Gog. So after God destroys all of them, and they're going to be buried, there's a seven-month period, and during that time, the birds and the animals are feasting on the flesh of all of these dead people. Well, Revelation 19 talks about the supper of the great God, right? 
where the birds come and fle- feast on the flesh of captains and mighty men and, and the rich and the poor and, and, and all these different people. The parallel again. Again, this is happening right at the coming of Jesus Christ. Right. Boy, I want to get into a lot of prophecy here. I, I know I can't do that. But Revelation, has there's a principle to understand Revelation is that there's a repeat and enlarge principle. There, there's a, what, what it says one time, it's going to say it again. Sometimes in more depth, sometimes from another angle, but it's going to go over the same ground. So Jesus Christ comes like five times in the book of Revelation. Because it builds up to the second coming, boom, and then it goes back and gives more details. It builds up to the second coming, and boom, it goes back. And so you see this. And so uh, Revelation chapter 6 builds up to the second coming there. In Revelation uh, uh, chapter um, 19, you have Jesus coming in Revelation 19. Revelation 16, there at the end of the seventh trumpet, uh, in which we're going to look at that one here in just a moment. Conspiracy of Gog, uh, Gog's, Gog and his allies against God's people. There's a conspiracy. In the same way, there's a conspiracy of Babylon against God's people in Revelation 19. God's intervention and total defeat of the enemies. Again, the parallel right there in Revelation. A searching before the final and complete annihilation of Gog and Magog. Now, Revelation talks about a thousand-year period, a millennium. And actually, the book of Ezekiel talks about a time of searching. And I don't, know, I don't know if that's an exact parallel, but it's pretty interesting as you, as you read those passages together. And then finally, the restoration of God's people and His promised presence. And In fact, I'll tell you what, it's really neat. You end the book of Ezekiel, look at the last words of the book of Ezekiel. It says, all the way around shall be 18,000 cubits, and the name of that city uh, from that day shall be, the Lord is there. The Lord is there! And you go to the book of Revelation, what do you find? The tabernacle of God will be with them. And the Lord will be, the, God will be their God, and they shall be his people, right? The Lord is there. He'll be with them, it says. Now, just to show you just how completely clear this is, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to look at, well, you don't have to turn there. I got it on the screen if you want to look up. Um, Revelation 20, verse 7 and 8. It says, when the thousand years have been expired, so this is after the thousand years is over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. The number is as the sand of the sea. Whose number is the sand of the sea? So Gog and Magog is not mentioned by name throughout Revelation, though a lot of the symbols of Gog and Magog are. Just like uh, in the Bible, the Antichrist. The Antichrist is the little horn is of Daniel 7. The Antichrist is the beast of Revelation 13, the first beast. The Antichrist is the man of sin, the son of perdition. Uh, the harlot, of Re- the Babylon, the mother of harlots in Revelation chapter 17. All these different terms referring to the, the Antichrist are different aspects of the Antichrist. Of course, in, in First and Second John, you also called the actual Antichrist. But here you come and you find another symbol applying to the Antichrist. And what is that symbol? It's Gog and Magog. And, and what we have is Gog and Magog representing all the enemies of God. And that's what you see in the Ezekiel 38 and 39. You see the enemies of God. That's what it's all about. So who is Gog and Magog? Like I said, we got a very specific definition. It says, to deceive the nations, plural, which are in the four corners of the earth. Four corners is a, a, usually a Bible euphemism representing global. So here's the question. Who is Gog and Magog? Here's the answer. The nations around the earth. The nations all around the planet that will eventually be destroyed in the judgment. You want to know who Gog and Magog is? It's right there. We don't have to guess. We don't have to stretch. We don't have to to, to wonder. It tells us. And by the way, Gog and Magog, the true fulfillment of that that we have today happens after the thousand years. How far are we away from that? At least a thousand years away. <laughs> so friends, to better understand the Bible, we must realize that, that, that all the promises of God and, and, and the threatenings of God are conditional. You understand that when God gave the prophecy to Ezekiel 38 and 39, I believe God had original plan for Israel. If they would accept his plan, if they would not reject the Messiah, God could have done some amazing things to them. But watch what happens. They 
did reject Jesus. They did not keep his commandments. And therefore, Jesus said something very significant. This is Matthew 21. I forget the verse. He says, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation bearing fruits. He says, the Jewish nation will no longer be the repository of my truth. I'm giving it to the Gentiles. Now, did God change? No, God always has plan B <laughs> and C and D. When Jonah was gone going and preaching to Nineveh, it's going to be destroyed in 40 days. Was it destroyed in 40 days? No. Was God a liar? No, because they repented. And I encourage you to go and to read Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. I was going to read it today, but I don't have time. But I write this down, Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10, and Hebrews 11, 39 to 40. It makes it very clear that when God says, I'm going to do something bad to a nation, if they repent, I won't do the bad thing. If God says, I'm going to do something good to a nation, and they, re and they go and do the wrong thing, God's not going to do the good thing for them. God made a promise to Abraham. He was going to keep that promise. But man broke his part of the covenant, so God reestablished that promise upon the Gentiles, the seed of Abraham through Jesus. Amen? And the followers and believers in Jesus Christ. So Ezekiel 38 and 39 was, a, was, a, was, was going to be an amazing, in a lot of ways, literal fulfillment. But when that didn't work out because of the re their rebellion, God takes it and applies it in a more apocalyptic sense for the last days, taking various different elements to do that. So to summarize, the Ezekiel and Revelation passages teach us that the enemies of God were going to attack, that God will deliver and destroy, that God's name will be vindicated and glorified, and that God would dwell with his people. That's what Ezekiel is telling us. That's what the book of Revelation is telling us. We don't have to stretch and find some uh, application of Russia that is not in the Bible. But let me ask you a question. What about Russia and prophecy? Is Russia in the book of Revelation? I submit to you that the answer is yes. You say, wait a minute, you just told us that it's not. Watch this. Russia's Revelation, because if you read Revelation 14, which we heard earlier in our scripture reading, it says that I heard another angel, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to who? To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Okay, every nation in the last days includes Russia and America and Greece and Portugal and South Africa and China and Taiwan and the Philippines, all these nations in the entire world is included under that nation's kindred, tongue, and people. So, do you see Russia in Revelation? Absolutely! Jesus loves Russia, and he wants us to preach the three angels' messages to Russia. Because guess what? All the nations are going to, the third angel's message is a warning about receiving the mark of the beast. All the nations are going to enforce this mark of the beast mandate. And it's only those who are loyal to God by keeping His commandments and having the faith of Jesus that will stand against that mandate. And I'm telling you, friends, every nation is going to be involved in that. Yes, the U.S. might be a ringleader in it, but every citizen of this planet is going to have to make a choice, and they're going to have to face this test. Revelation 17, 15 through 18. I will briefly read this one for you here. Revelation 17. Look at this one here. This is, again, talking about the scarlet harlot, the mother of Babylon. Watch this. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. What does the water represent? Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So you've got, again, Russia included in this last day confederacy against God and his people. Watch this. Verse 16. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Remember how every man's sword will be against his brother. That's what's happening here. They're turning on each other. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Let me tell you something. This prophecy about the papacy, the influence that the papacy is going to have over all the nations of the world is going to come to pass. In fact, it's happening right now before our eyes. In fact, this just this last week, there's, I'm telling you, the, the, it's a whole other sermon. Woo, guys. The papacy is working hard to get the entire world to come under its delusion. 
And we, and, but there's people in there. God has His people in Babylon that He loves and He cherishes that are hearing and loving the truth and are coming out. But they still need to hear the warning that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. They need to hear the warning that if they stay in Babylon, they're going to suffer the plagues of Babylon. It's time to come out. During Armageddon, you know, Revelation 17 talk, okay. The battle of Armageddon, you got the, this is a really interesting parallel here. Revelation chapter 16, you've got the battle of Armageddon. This is what leads up into the, uh, um, uh, the seventh plague. And th- th- this, uh, this battle of Armageddon experience is where you see the waters of the Euphrates River dried up. Now, Euphrates River was the river that supplied uh, its you know, water to the city of Babylon anciently. Water represents the people's multitudes, nations, and tongues, right? So we know that the support system for Babylon is the waters. And where does the Euphrates River run? From north to south, kind of northwest to southeast. But it runs that direction. And the king of the north, we got to do a study on the king of the north. Daniel chapter 11. We know the king of the north is that same entity, the papacy. And we know that there's going to be that confederacy to work against God's people, right? That God will intervene himself. And so the, the, the waters, which would include Russia, is the support system for the papacy to accomplish the great final deception that she plans to do in these last days. I could go on and on and on, but I'm not going to. Where do we see Russia at the very end? Russia is not just the people that we need to reach out to with the gospel. But Russia is also included among Gog and Magog that surround the city of God. I want you to chew on this thought. After the thousand years are over, Satan goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Now, I don't know after the thousand years if there's going to be national boundaries like we know it today. But I can imagine Russia as a nation, maybe the resurrected, you know, uh, all the resurrected um, uh, murderers of Russia in the past, the USSR, you know, with Stalin and, and uh, all them, they're going to rise up. And they're going to try to attack God's city. And God's going to intervene. He's going to bring judgment upon them. And God will ultimately destroy them. So where's Russia in Bible prophecy? Russia is Gog and Magog. But not in the same sense that you've been taught or told. But not just Russia. America, not just America, Canada, Mexico, every nation on this planet is going to be included among those who fight against God. But there's going to be one distinct group of people that are belong to another nation. It's called the kingdom of God. Are you part of the kingdom of God? Jesus preached about the kingdom. Just do a study on the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Powerful study. Watch this. The seventh angel sounded. This is leading right up to the second coming of Christ. The seventh angel sounded. And there was loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. If you want to live forever and ever, you want to be part of a kingdom that's going to last forever, you've got to be part of the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom of grace will lead you to the kingdom of glory. Amen? Time is short. That's my closing thought. That's what Sister Lisa shared earlier. Time is short. We must get to know our Bibles. We must become citizens of God's kingdom now. We must proclaim the three angels' messages to all far and near. To those in Russia, to those in America, to everybody in between. There should be a hundred missionaries where there's now one missionary. But we're so comfortable. Lord, make us uncomfortable so we'll go where you want us to go. Friends, if you want to be part of this final end time work of witnessing to the world, of sharing the three angels' messages to the world, in whatever sphere God puts you in, if you want to be part of that final end time work of warning, I invite you to stand as I close with prayer.